Okay, so welcome everybody. I get started with the introduction. Uh, so uh, today we have another exciting edition of our uh, online seminar series on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Uh, there's no need uh, to record uh, today's talks. Uh, both speakers agreed uh, to recording and we do so. And the talks will then be uploaded to the ISMRBS uh, YouTube channel. You can see the link given here. So um, uh, just to remind everybody, we use the Q&A uh, button to, uh, to handle the questions and answers uh, and not the chat function. So please type in your questions into the Q&A and then uh, the moderator will read it or we can also unmute you and you can speak uh, once you have raised your hand. I also would like to remind you of the early career researcher uh, webinar uh, organized and supported by uh, the ICMRBS. Uh, which you see here. Without further ado, then I hand over to the moderator of the first talk, which is Anthony Watts. Anthony, are you there? I'm there now, right? <laughs> you got me, good. So thank you very much indeed, Marcus. And uh, firstly, let me say how delighted I am that ICMRBS name and tradition is being maintained through these difficult times by holding these re regular webinars. The ICMRBS meetings I've attended have always been very special flavor, most enjoyable, productive, very warm and friendly atmosphere. Um, and that's my first one in 1978 in Nara to the last one in Dublin in 2018. So talking about history, uh, today's speaker, Anna Ulrich, um, joined my lab in 1988, maybe 87, Anna will remember. And she did something really unusual at that time. Not only was she a German student in Britain, she came from the chemistry department in Oxford and asked if she could carry out her final year undergraduate project, a bit like a diploma bite, in my lab in biochemistry. It was quite unusual. High risk, especially at that time, and I'd only been in Oxford for eight years, and solid state NMR was really very much at its infancy. Here she is working at the lab at about that time. She worked on lipid membranes using wide-line deuterium NMR and submitted a very nice project for which you might expect she got awarded a first-class degree, quite justifiably. She then asked to join the lab as a graduate student, had absolutely no hesitation in taking her on. Her commitment, dedication, energy and aptitude was just clear right at that very early start in her stage in her career. And of course, it's still very evident today. She continued the pure lipid membrane work of her project, produced some very nice and well-cited papers on the link between um, hydration and dynamics in biology and membranes here. And it's very much still in vogue today, um, in particular receptor technology. Um, she also took on a very tough project for which I think she has not been fully recognized. Against all the odds of using low sensitivity deuterium to probe membrane proteins, she managed to resolve the confirmation of retinol in bacteriodopsin in natural membranes in both the ground and the photoactivated state. This was before any membrane protein crystal structures, except of course Richard Henderson's 7.5 EM uh, Angstrom EM structure, for which of course uh, no retinol was observed at all. And that data that she produced has become more and more accepted mm -hmm. as the resolution of bacteriodopsin crystals have got higher and higher. Anna always looked for imaginative ways of presenting her work and she will recognize this. She's the only person I know of who took a tennis racket. You can see some tennis balls here from the masculine groups that are on the beat iron and ring. And then she hinged the handle to show the all trans to cis isomerization of retinol within the protein to demonstrate in a talk, and that sat in the lab for a couple of generations. It wasn't all work, of course, and to Anna often entertained the, us with her music and proficient guitar playing. I'm not sure if you still play, Anna, but I very much enjoyed and remember that. So in 1993, Anna was awarded a DPhil from Oxford in chemistry. Chris Dobson and Joe Sadie were her examiners. Um, we don't have a cum laude in Oxford, but I'm sure she would have got that if uh, it was possible. 
stayed for a couple of years later, uh, longer, and then went to Germany through EMBL, Jena, <laughs> bravely in my view, took a di directorship at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Technology, where she's continued to be highly productive and influenza, influential. Um, at a personal level, if I may, I'm delighted that she's not lost her roots in appreciating the biology and functional aspects of her work. In particular, antibiotic action, which in my view is vital since antimicrobial resistance will in the next, will be the next worldwide health hazard, sadly. Over to you, Anna, and super to meet you again, if only virtually this time. Well, thank you, Tony. That was a really nice introduction and a great opportunity to see you again after all these years. And a great thank you also to the organizers for keeping the NMR community together. So today I'm going to talk about some work in progress on helix-helix interactions on receptor tyrosine kinases. And I would like to show you in the course of the next, well, 20 minutes, how we come up with these predominantly dimeric structures of receptor modules in membranes using the same methods that Tony had mentioned were developed early on in my scientific development. Before I forget, I would like to issue great thanks to the key players in this project. And even though much of this work has not yet been published, um, our PhD student, Sebastian, has just defended his PhD very successfully and is now um, maybe looking for a postdoc position somewhere. He was supervised by Torsten, our expert in membrane proteins, and Stefan, our expert in NMR. Pavish is the head of the peptide synthesis facility. Lee is currently doing some calculations, and Dirk was the initiator of the project, who has now already left the lab. Now, let me introduce to you the structural aspects of receptor tyrosine kinases, which are known to occur virtually on every eukaryotic cell, as um, receptors of ligands, hormones, such as growth hormones or insulin. And it's known that the extra membranous domains um, receive the hormone. Then by some way or the other, this allosteric um, signal is guided across the lipid bilayer so that in the cytosol, autophosphorylation can take place and the signal cascade can set off. Now, these hormones are responsible for proliferation, differentiation, but sometimes things can go wrong. And if a, a receptor tyrosine kinase is constitutively activated, this can lead to uncontrolled growth and cancer. So currently the literature tells following model of activation that monomeric receptors are situated in the membrane with a single transmembrane spanning helix. And a dimer, a ligand comes along, possibly a dimer or a non-symmetric monomer to dimerize the receptor and switch it on. But it is known that some receptors are also pre-assembled in an inactive dimeric state. And then the activation by the ligand will have to lead to some other type of conformational change, presumably involving the transmembrane segments in order to start signaling. And it is these transmembrane segments that we are interested in because the extra membrane domains have been crystallized with and without ligands, and a lot is known about that. But the behavior of these elements in a fluid lipid matrix is quite hard to tackle, and that's where we can do a good job with solid state NMR. I must say that uh, many people regard these transmembrane helices as simple, boring, hydrophobic pieces of equipment, but they are not. They are very char characteristic. They have preferential tilt angles, interaction residues, and we will see that even when we isolate them and look at their structures without the remaining extra membranous parts, quite some interesting data emerge. So there are several points that argue for a very important role for transmembrane segments in signaling. On the one hand, it is known that many mutations can occur in this helix leading to constituent activation without a ligand. That's known to be associated with various kinds of tumors. And likewise, there are a number of viruses such as the bovine papilloma virus, which is an oncoprotein consisting of just a short transmembrane helix itself, which can activate the receptor without a ligand, in this case, PDGFR receptor, 
to cause verrucas in cows and other types of cancer. So this um, leads to the speculations that have been presented in the literature over the many years, how dimerization can take place. Is it just a simple lateral translation of assembly or does some scissoring take place as an allosteric um, effect? Do the helices rotate relative to each other or does even a piston motion take place? Well, we don't know. There are several models, lots of liquid state NMR studies, but not so much has been done in proper lipid bilayers yet in ambient conditions. So before we go into the data, I would like to introduce some other general concepts about membrane proteins that are very important at this point. Because before you start doing your experiments, you certainly have to look at your sequence and see whether it's just hydrophobic or whether there are some conspicuous residues, such as charges that can form salt bridges or hydrogen bonding residues that are most likely involved in specific interaction. Due to the thermodynamics in this hydrophobic environment, any polar interactions have a large energetic contribution. Furthermore, it's interesting to see what flanking residues may be at the periphery of the helical segment. Aromatic residues are known to act as anchors in determining the depth of insertion of the helix into the bilayer. But it is even more important to know that tryptophan residues, especially, but also phenylalanines, can determine the azimuthal rotation angle and serve as a rotational anchor to give the helix one preferred sideways alignment. And that's actually what's going to be really important in this talk. Like tryptophan, also lysine residues can contribute to azimuthal rotation and anchoring by snorkeling up into the aqueous bilayer. Then you may also have to look out for glycine-rich motifs, which typically induce a right-handed helix, helix packing, or leucine-rich heptad motifs, which are typical for a left-handed packing. So these are the concepts that we're going to look at before we go into the data. Now, our aims are to compare three different types of isolated transmembrane domains from three receptors shown here, and they're all color-coded throughout the talk and look at the oncoprotein E5, which forms a complex with the PDGFR receptor. With solid state NMR and macroscopically oriented samples under ambient conditions, we are going to obtain the accurate helix orientation and the azimuthal alignment, that's important. So from these 3D structures, we will be able to derive models for helix-helix interactions and hopefully say something interesting about receptor activation. The molecules we're looking at are the EGF receptor, PGFR receptor alpha, PGFR receptor beta, the oncoprotein E5, and the hetero complex with PGGFR beta. Now, briefly go through the methods used. We check for reconstitution of our proteins by using conventional circular dichroism to show that they're alpha helical. We can roughly estimate the membrane alignment using oriented circular dichroism, using stacks, multilamellar stacks of samples. And the very same type of sample is used also for NMR, where all of you will be familiar with that. It is possible to determine the helix tilt angle from uniformly 15N labeled samples that are produced recombinantly using um, oriented bilayers and two-dimensional SAMI or PZEMA spectra. To determine the azimuthal rotation angle, which is the alignment of the helix around its own symmetry axis, is more uh, ambitious. Therefore, you require a selective nitrogen label, preferably several of those. So we, here we have to work with uh, synthetic peptides, and they are treated in the same way as um, before. We also introduce fluorine labels to measure distances and count spins, but I will not have the time and it's too early to talk about these results yet. But oligomerization states can be estimated by SDS page. So let's go for the first example. The epidermal growth factor receptor. Here you see the fragment we produce and we highlight here the trans predicted transmembrane region. I also point out the conspicuous residues that I had outlined earlier. So here's a polar N-terminus, which interestingly is folded as a 310 helix, which is known from liquid state NMR and detergent myocells. And this phenylalanine may or may not serve as an anchoring 
um, residue. So briefly, we check the secondary structures, but it's important to do that in many different types of lipids, very long chain lipids, the Uruku ELPC, down to very short chain lipids, because it turns out that these relatively long transmembrane helices typically become very unstable in these thin membranes. But we were lucky with EGFR, it's very stable. Unlike the other examples I'm going to show you, they tend to aggregate in the conventional of the MPC or POPC bilayers that are usually used in biophysics. So um, using uh, oriented samples, circular dichroism can tell us something about the tilt angle. And you see here at 208 nanometers, we have a systematic change in tilt angle, meaning that yes, the helices adapt to the bilayer thickness qualitatively. We get much more quantitative results turning to nitrogen 15 NMR. Here you see a SAMI spectrum in gray, that's from the uniformly labeled protein. The PISA wheel analyzes in the um, icosan ULPC to a tilt angle of nine degrees, plus minus five, and an order parameter close to one because the helix is quite upright. And it becomes more interesting now if we look at the azimuth rotation angle for which these four color-coded amino acids were separately introduced with a nitrogen 15 label, and all the vectors point to a tilt angle into the direction of the face of the helix containing leucine 665. So this is how I will describe azimuth rotations, the direction of the tilt into which the helix turns into the membrane. Here you see a whole series of um, PISA wheels and going from thick to thin membranes, it's clear that the tilt angle increases up to 37 degrees, whereas the rotation angle rho stays constant. So the helix can adjust to the membrane thickness, but only by changing the tilt and not the azimuth rotation. It also becomes a bit more dynamic according to the molecular order parameter. And it's interesting to see that the change in tilt angle is not enough to compensate for the decrease in membrane thickness. So it is clear that part of the protein needs to unravel to obtain these stable situations in thin membranes. Therefore, we conclude that our protein is present as a monomeric state, which we also see by SDS page, as it is not constrained by any oligomerization and it seems to be able to unwind its more polar N-terminal 310 helix. Now, this is the final picture, taking all the parameters together, how the single helix is located in the bilayer. The tilt angle was determined and the azimuth rotation is displayed so that we can now see all the conspicuous residues. It's very nice to see that this phenylalanine is in the perfect position to serve as an anchoring residue because it is here at the edge of the helix diving into the membrane. That is typical and provides a lot of stability. Interestingly, these two polar residues as part of the 310 helix are facing towards us. So they are at the side of the helix. Hence, they are available for lateral interaction with another helix if this wants to dimerize. But we remember that in thin membranes, as we know occur in the endoplasmatic reticulum or the Golgi, this dimerization motif most likely starts to unravel, so it cannot dimerize. But transfer of this protein into thick membranes, as in the plasma membrane or even the lipid rafts, should enable dimerization. Now, here is another view from the top as we dock our 3D structures to one another side by side. The side chains have not been optimized, but it shows that yes, interactions are possible even via these two polar residues. And um, naturally, in this case, a left-handed dimer will emerge. A right-handed one is not possible given our Azimuto data. Remarkably, this structure differs from the NMR structure that was determined by Arseniev in my cells because he identified two different types of glycine-rich interaction motifs. They're not perfect GXXXG motifs, but in, at least according to our structure, they are located at the top and the bottom of the tilted helix and not at the side. So if we assume that in our proper bilayers, this aromatic label serves as a membrane anchor to determine the azimuth rotation, these two interaction motifs are not perfectly accessible for dimerization in a membrane. After all, um, this work was done in detergent micelles. 
Now, the second example is a platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha. Again, we have here two conspicuous polar residues and a putative membrane anchor. Let's have a look what it looks like after we go through all the data analysis. And we were very shocked. These two polar residues are not available for side-by-side -side dimerization because they're at the edge of the helix. And the tryptophan residue is not available as a membrane anchor because it also points towards us rather than into the membrane. So is, as a monomer, this molecule certainly does not, does not look happy. But if we consider dimerization by docking two monomers side by side, it turns out that the tryptophan can engage in cation pi interactions with the lysine of the opposing partner. And this model has actually already been po postulated by Polianski according to MD simulations. And indeed our right-handed assembly just coming out from docking is perfectly compatible with the interaction interface postulated by him as an inactive dimer. His model went on to postulate also here on the right-hand side an active dimer involving residues on the opposite face of the helix, which would correspond in our structure, a change of the handedness, just docking them back to back or front to front. And so it is tempting to speculate that possibly receptor activation occurs by a change in handedness between the two helices. After all, these are very slippery hydrophobic interfaces that could slide past one another, and yet the azimuthal rotation is determined by the anchoring tryptophan. Next example is the PGGFR beta receptor. It differs from the alpha receptor in quite a number of residues, and there are far more polar residues here, plus some putative anchors. Let's have a look what it looks like, and lo and behold, tryptophan down here is a good anchoring residue, and serine here is available for side-by-side -side interaction. But interestingly, here this phenylalanine does not serve as an anchor and that serine cannot engage in dimerization. So these two residues don't have a function yet, but we will see later that they will be engaged in interaction with the oncoprotein E5. So a view of the dimer shows a nice interface. Again, this still needs to be um, perfect perfected by MD simulations, but um, we're pretty sure that there are great possibilities for hydrogen bonding here and not much of a twist in the helices, no kinks either. And yes, we obtain a left-handed dimer, which had in fact also been um, proposed by Oates early on by MD simulations, and now we have good experimental evidence. Interestingly, this dimeric structure is different from our earlier NMR, liquid state NMR analysis that we published in DPC My Cells, because in My Cells, the anchoring residues do not have a strong hole. That's why we believe the bilayer data more. And now we come to the last example, the oncoprotein E5 from papilloma virus, which is known to activate the PGGFR receptor beta that I've showed you just a moment ago. We know that this occurs in membranes as a dimer because the peptide itself is 44 amino acids long with disulfide bridges at the terminus, but we only look at the transmembrane segment, which we've shown earlier, to be dimeric even without the disulfide bridges. And there are two aromatic residues and one conspicuative glutamine residue, which has already been shown by mutation to be involved in interaction, not just E5 to E5, but also E5 to PGGFR receptor. And this is our result. The tryptophans are both ideally poised as anchoring residues, placing the glutamine onto the side, ready for interaction, ready for dimerization. So the dimer is nicely held together by a hydrogen bond here and everything is okay, except for the fact that it is known that not just glutamine here is involved in interaction with the receptor, to cause constituent activation, but also this aspartate here is known to interact with the receptor. And clearly that cannot happen in the structure shown here because they are on opposite faces of the helix. How can they interact at the same time? And glutamine is completely covered by its neighboring helix. So what happens when E5, the oncoprotein, is placed together with PGGFR 
the receptor into the same bilayer. Here we see the sequences with the known interactions that have been identified by mutational analysis. And here are the SAMI results. What we did was to label the oncoprotein with nitrogen 15 and use unlabeled receptor protein. So the PISA wheel and the selective label give one particular alignment, which we just obtained, which you see here, the view of the helix from the side with the glutamine that engages in helix-helix interactions. And now we add, well, that's the dimer, we add the unlabeled PDGFR and see that the whole PISA wheel rotates by minus 65 degrees. The tilt angle is not changed, but we have a significant rotation, which leads to a rotation of the helical wheel. And here you see how the helices are rotated consecutively so that this conspicuous glutamine residue now becomes available on the surface of the dimeric construct together with that previously inaccessible aspartate residue, which is known to interact simultaneously with glutamine with the PGGF receptor. So rotation of E5 without a change in the tilt angle creates a new interaction interface of the surface and now receptor can be activated. The same spiel goes on by looking at the receptor in the presence of unlabeled E5 protein. And you see here is um, a polar residue known to interact with E5. E5. Um, a rotation takes place by almost a right angle. And here the helix rotates and lo and behold, an interaction interface on the side of the helix becomes available to interact with E5 as it has been postulated from mutational analysis. And it's nice to point out that the original tryptophan anchor is replaced after the rotation by a new phenylalanine membrane anchor. So that's the view of the dimer. E5 is known to be disulfide bridge, so we place that into the center and dock two phenylalanines onto this structure with the alignment that has just been determined. And we see that all interactions are perfectly fulfilled. Now, interestingly enough, uh, another assembly possibility is conceivable because in this one to two to one dimer, which brings the two receptor units in yellow close to each other so that autophosphorylation could take place here, there are some more polar residues suddenly exposed to the side. So we thought, what happens if we dock further oligomers onto each other. Now we have a dimeric PDGFR assembly and we can do away with the rest. So another model would be conceivable that PDGFR actually forms a dimer via the serine residues. And now it is a right-handed dimer as opposed to the left-handed dimer that we had obtained of PDGFR on its own. And here E5 itself being a dimer would cause the two monomers of the receptor to change the handedness. We cannot differentiate between these models. Now it needs some further spin counting and distance measurements. So that's the view of the alternative two to two to two model. And it is conceivable that indeed um, the original PDGFR, which is in an equilibrium between monomers and dimers, can either go into the one to one to two to one model by um, deassembling and reassembling, or it could go via a change of handedness into the six helix complex. Well, we don't know yet, but the underlying structures in yellow and in green are the same on the left model and on the right model. I've indicated that with the black point, which designates the Atsimuto rotation angle. So to summarize, We've had quite a number of interesting molecules here. Um, epidermal growth factor receptor, which is monomeric and is able to dimerize via an N-terminal motif, which can unravel in thin membranes. The PGFR alpha receptor, which is pre-assembled and potentially changes its handedness. The PGFR beta receptor, which is pre-assembled, but now is a left-handed dimer as opposed to the right-handed dimer we have here in the alpha receptor. 
Then we look at the viral oncoprotein E5, which is preassembled as a very stable, inactive left-handed dimer. But if it interacts with the receptor, both the receptor helices and the E5 helices rotate by a significant degree to allow complex formation with all the um, identified residues or the polar residues, either as a tetrameric bundle or a six-fold bundle. If I may summarize, um, it is interesting to see by NMR indeed this change in azimuthal rotation, which keeps the same tilt angles. So the helix bundles are stabilized on different scales, the helix-helix um, side-by-side -side assembly and the local side chain interactions. I would dare to speculate that the azimuthal rotation angle is really a well-defined and critical property of transmembrane helices because the azimuthal rotation controls helix-helix interactions by recognition of other polar side chains. And at least in single transmembrane domains, the azimuthal rotation angle tends to be determined by aromatic anchoring residues. Whereas the helix tilt angle, which we and others have often focused on in the past, that does seem to reflect or at least respond largely just to changes in the membrane thickness. And it's important to point out that in our hands, some of the long transmembrane domains, 28 hydrophobic residues, tend to be very unstable in thin bilayers and tend to aggregate. And finally, the receptor tyrosine kinases that we have compared here use rather different models of recognition and activation. So we've seen left-handed examples and right-handed examples and it all boils down to the individual residues that are at the termini and certain polar ones that allow helix-helix interactions. With that, um, I have already acknowledged the current key players, but I would like to say also a big thank you to past and previous students who have contributed to this um, work and to our cooperation partners in Münster and especially the MD simulations that are being carried out to refine these NMR structural parameters. With that, I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you very much uh, for a very clear and uh, exciting presentation. So there is already a question from Matthias Buck. Uh, so he uh, states, great talk and exciting work on it. Perhaps I missed it. Exactly what uh, solid state NMR information do you use to show a helix-helix specific residue-residue contact? Uh, and then he uh, goes on saying, but in solution NMR, one typically looks at chemical shifts, but our senior and colleagues suggested that maybe it's better to use side chain dynamics. So I guess it's yeah, so what is the solid state NMR information which uh, defines, let's say, the helix helix specific residue residue contacts, which you showed? Yeah, that is in the um, indirect um, docking. We determine the helix tilt and the helix alignment of our NMR sample, not knowing whether the helix is monomeric or oligomeric, but we have some reliable data here that allow us to position the helix into the membrane so that we can look which polar amino acids or which side chains are aligned on the side of the tilted helix or which are inaccessible to side-by-side -side dimerization. So in the end, we simply dock the helices as we position them into the bilayer side by side and look where are interactions possible. We cannot see them yet. We are using fluorine NMR to measure distances, but that's a lot of effort. And introducing these sensitive labels can perturb the subtle interactions in these interfaces as we found. But um, it is um, not possible with the oriented samples approach that we do to characterize as solution NMR people do it, the defined local interface all the way through the helix. Thank you very much. Uh, so then we have a question from Grace Roya, Royapa uh, and asking where are the cancer mutants located, or mutations, I guess. Uh, do they block dimerization? Uh, please comment. Oh, I 
know of some examples where dimerization is actually enhanced, so that leads to constitutive activation of the receptor. And then it's switched on all the time. And this would be in the transmembrane segment, but I can't tell you the number of the amino acid. Okay, maybe we can discuss that later, yeah. Thank you. So uh, Anthony uh, Watts uh, would like to ask a question. Yes, nice talk, Anna, thank you very much. And um, bilayer thickness, of course, is, is, is the driving force and the dominant uh, aspect to the helix tilt, but are there any subtle interactions from lipid head groups? I mean, you talk about cation pi interactions, and of course, choline head groups could have subtle interactions. What are the lipid protein interactions, apart from just thickness? That, do you know of any? Well, um, you know, we have worked a lot on lipid curvature and spontaneous curvature. In these hydrophobic transmembrane segments, that does not seem to play such an important role because there is no chance of them flipping out. But um, charge may play a role, although we have used switter ionic lipids throughout to avoid any preferential um, effects of side chains that may be available for protein-protein interactions. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe if I may follow up, so at which lipid in the end did you settle then for all these studies uh, yeah. in terms of length and so on? We used um, Icosin at UPC because that shows here, well, that the helix tilt angle for the four different uh, constructs um, changes a lot, but um, the longer segments um, tend to aggregate in the thin membranes and are only stable up to the Rukuil and Icosinaul. So um, Icosinaul was the lipid in which all receptors and the E5 were ideally stable. But if we find that E5 and the receptor start to aggregate on their own, if you place them into thinner membranes. Interestingly, if they are assembled as a complex, they can be measured even in the OPC, which is already quite a thin bilayer here. So they tend to stabilize each other. And of course, since we cut off large parts of the extra membraneous regions, it's not surprising if our samples tend to aggregate, which the natural protein surely wouldn't. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I think we have to move on to the second talk today, uh, which will be introduced by Christian. Hello, and thank you very much, Vladislav, for agreeing to give a presentation here. <clears throat> so Vladislav is a professor at the Department of Chemistry and Molecular Biology at the University of Gothenburg in, uh, in Sweden. Um, he received his master in 1989 uh, in Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, actually studying molecular biology and biophysics. Then he continued a PhD uh, in biophysics, uh, supervised by um, uh, Vladimir Bistrov and uh, Sasha Arsenyev. And I think Bistrov must have been dying already at that time, because I, I think I remember visiting in 89, and then shortly later, I think he was, he was, was dead. So I, I, I guess he did not survive your whole PhD, which was finished in, uh, in 2000, uh, uh, quatsch, quatsch, in, in 1993. And, um, and then um, uh, Vladimir went on uh, as, a, as a researcher, actually, um, at the Shemiakin of Shinikov Institute, uh, where Bistrov actually uh, was. Uh, then um, in uh, 1998, he became an assistant professor at Göteborg University and then went up in the ranks um, to full professor uh, since 2015 um, at this place. He also had some research visits uh, in Louis K's group at the University of Tokyo. Um, it says in the CV, several stay, short stays. So, <laughs> uh, so we are looking forward to your presentation today, Vladimir. Okay, thank you, Christian. And uh, thank, uh, thank you all organizers for giving me, uh, me this opportunity uh, to, uh, to present my 
my research. So uh, I should start to present uh, the beautiful team which is which was behind this uh, project and uh, specifically uh, uh, Dmitry uh, uh, was the uh, person who designed uh, all these experiments, pulse sequences, and uh, Panagiota uh, performed most of the analysis. Also, uh, Irena prepared samples for, for tau sample, phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated. And other people I will mention later on uh, in uh, relation to specific points. So uh, what, are we, uh, what, what do we uh, try to, uh, to study here? So we are targeting uh, protein hotspots. So these are essentially um, uh, points of interest uh, where, which we usually like to study. Uh, for example, uh, this may be um, uh, points of post-translational modification, well, for example, phosphorylation, maybe sites where uh, protein interact with other molecules, interaction sites, there may be sites of distinct dynamics, which changes uh, uh, on some functional changes. There may be residues involved in elasteric pathways or maybe those uh, involved in uh, transition to low populated states. So we like this study, uh, we like to focus on these residues, uh, maybe while uh, saving efforts and time uh, by uh, uh, well, sacrificing attention to, to other parts of maybe very large complex uh, protein systems. Uh, from a uh, spectroscopy perspective, uh, if uh, we have uh, if we have a hotspot or some event, for example, binding or post-translational modification, then something will happen in the spectrum. Uh, for example, signals may change their position, or maybe intensity, or maybe they will have some characteristic relaxation changes. They may appear or disappear, and you name it. There may be some other. Uh, changes of parameters which we can uh, detect in our experiments. So let's assign these residues uh, like newly affected or newly peeled signals. Uh, for this, we uh, suggest a new tool which we call focus spectroscopy, FOSI, and uh, it has certain features. In particular, we like to be very uh, specific, so we like to have super resolution. Uh, which is achieved by uh, uh, that our experiments are essentially high dimensional uh, analogs of high dimensional experiments like up to 7D. Uh, on the other hand, we run them in, 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 a, in a simple 2D mode. And by doing that, we avoid losing, uh, losing uh, the square root of two for every, every sample dimension. Also, uh, the way we organized our experiments allows optimal monetization transfer uh, which could be better than, than uh, broadband experiments. Also, uh, these experiments, experiments are naturally longitudinally optimized because we only work with specific spin systems uh, and avoid to, to, to touch other, uh, other spins. The experiments are fast. Uh, in our hands, uh, these 2D experiments could take maybe from a couple of minutes to one hour, depending on signal to noise for specific spin system. Uh, for short experiments, we can afford uh, to have versatility and adaptivity to specific uh, spin system. Uh, so we may have a toolbox of different uh, options and pulse sequences, which we can select for specific uh, spin system. It's also easy to analyze uh, because in these 2D experiments, we usually have only one signal to detect. Well, if you're less lucky, that may be just few signals, maybe two or three, I'll show you later. Uh, so uh, these are our uh, 4C experiments, uh, which we have for the moment. Uh, well, the essential part of these experiments is that we reduce dimensionality by fixing uh, several known frequencies. Uh, for example, here I illustrate an experiment which goes uh, backwards. So uh, we fix, uh, uh, well, for example, if we if have a chance of all spectrum, then uh, just for having a peak there, we, we know three frequencies from a GNCO, like amide prod, amide nitrogen, and, and, and carbonyl. So we don't need to sample them anymore. We just fix them. And then we only need to sample uh, the remaining three frequencies, uh, which uh, we can do in 2D mode, because if you have only one signal, then 2D spectra, 2D planes of this uh, 3D is sufficient. Uh, we can also, of course, design experiments which go forward from residue i to residue i plus y one. And in this case, we need we may fix uh, frequencies from a chance alpha experiment, 
so we amide proton, amide nitrogen, and, and C alpha of, of, of the same residue. And then we read out CO and amide uh, nitrogen and proton of the residue I line plus minus one. And uh, it is also possible to, to create experiment, which we may call out and back, uh, where we can uh, sample uh, 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 either uh, C alpha or CO uh, around amide, amide group. So how does it work? Uh, well, for this, uh, we use selective polarization uh, transfer. And this part we actually uh, discussed a lot between Dmitry, Tama, Dirx, and myself. So that's the essence of, of, of these new experiments. Uh, this uh, selective polarization transfer, they essentially frequency selective because the transfer only happens uh, on, on the frequencies which we select. Uh, then uh, this type of polarization transfer, it, it could be very, uh, very effective and actually could uh, surpass in, in effectiveness of a broadband analogs of polarization transfer like ENAP or CRENAP too. Well, as I mentioned, they are also naturally longitudinally optimized. And a very good thing is that the theory of this uh, experiments or, or of this uh, selective polarization transfer is uh, relatively well known and understood. So we can uh, use it. Uh, just give you one exa example of one experiment which goes backwards. Uh, this experiment uses several, uh, several types of uh, polariz selective polarization transfer. So we start with polarization inversion. So this is very simple. We, uh, using a selective pulse, we uh, invert uh, atrocity polarization of the amide proton. And by doing that, we create this kind of uh, polarization. Uh, which can be used immediately. On the next step, uh, uh, which is uh, frequency selective and spin state selective uh, heteronuclear Hartman Hart. By uh, irradiating our system at four frequencies, we can organize direct, direct anti-phase to anti-phase uh, transfer, which is shown here. So we go from here to here uh, using four weak uh, uh, CVs. And they are given at uh, two, two given at frequency around amide nitrogen. So this one and the others are given around the carbonyl. So this kind of uh, sandwich allows you to, to organize this transfer in a very efficient way and, and frequency selective way. Uh, later on, uh, we also use uh, at this step shown here, uh, we need to make monetization transfer between these two. Uh, polarizations and, and also we like to uh, select uh, uh, frequency of uh, uh, C beta carbon. And this can be done uh, with so called longitudinal single field selective polarization transfer. And again, you need to use uh, CVs at four frequencies. Uh, frequencies are specified. I don't like to go deep into technicalities here. Instead, uh, I will present the showcase of this uh, example. So we apply this method to uh, study uh, phosphorylation of uh, tau protein. Uh, well, tau, as many of you know, uh, is a well, large intrinsically dissolved protein for this more than 440 residues. And we studied phosphorylation of this uh, by, by this uh, kinase. And uh, yeah, we use backward experiments for this example. Uh, here I present uh, our assignment strategy. Uh, so first of all, we compare two HNCO spectra of uh, phosphorylated and not phosphorylated tau. And uh, as we expect, we found several peaks which uh, disappeared or newly appeared in, in phosphorylated uh, sample. In particular, we have this signal which is uh, uh, called A here. That's a newly appeared peak, which we think should correspond to phosphorylated serine and threonine. Then uh, we uh, record two uh, other supplement, uh, supplementary experiments, which are protein selective. Well, uh, this experiment was originally suggested by Bernard Butcher, and we used a version which was implemented by uh, Warden Berman from, from Brooker, and that, that was very useful for this experiment. Uh, in this experiment, uh, you will see only, uh, only peaks corresponding to residues which are preceded by proline, this red version. In another version of the experiment, we see only those residues which are 
uh, followed by proline. And specifically, this peak A, which we are interested in, it, it turned out uh, to be followed by proline, which is a good, which is a good thing. Having this, uh, we can immediately look at the sequence of, uh, of tau and find the number of peptides, uh, which would correspond to this situation. So we have some phosphorylatable uh, residue, like uh, trianemoserine, followed by proline. So our task then is to select uh, out of this list, uh, correct uh, peptide. And we like to do it fast and, and, and 100, with 100% certainty. Well, this we do with our 4C experiments. And uh, that's just show how it works. So we start with uh, HNCO experiment. Then we have a peak, which we are interested in. Uh, we see that this peak uh, correspond to, well, to a residue followed by proline. So we see this peak in a proline selective experiment. Uh, thus, we have a, a, a motif like XP, where X is an unknown residue. Uh, using our uh, 4C experiment, backbone experiment, uh, we can find uh, uh, frequencies of the residue I minus one. So we go here. And in this spectrum, in this one dimensional spectrum, there is only one single peak. So it's 100% it's certain what we have. Uh, then we can make a next step. Uh, so we continue the work. So we go to a residue minus two. And uh, so we already in this motif. So we have three residues, uh, three unknown residues followed by proline. Then if you make next step, we end up, uh, well, we happily end up in, in, in a glycine. Uh, this we clearly see because in our, uh, our experiment, uh, glycine signal will, will have a negative intensity and also a uh, chemical shift of C-alpha has a characteristic value for glycines. So we are, we are sure that this is a glycine. Uh, then, uh, well, actually we have two signals here, uh, which may happen if, uh, if uh, uh, we have overlap in a HNCO spectrum. And of course, uh, tau, tau protein is uh, very large, so overlap is quite common there. Uh, anyway, uh, here uh, we can, uh, so we know that it's glycine, right? So uh, wait a sec. So then we have the, this kind of, uh, this motif. Uh, and this motif, uh, well, we, if you look at the sequence, there are only few on specifically three, uh, three version of this motif and only two uh, are possible for phosphorylation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to check if we can uh, define what's, what type of residue is here. And then we have a choice either serine or trianine. So we can check that uh, using this experiment where we can fix uh, uh, four uh, nuclei, amide uh, proton, nitrogen, carbonyl, and uh, C-alpha. And we also fix C-beta uh, if, we, if, we, if we can make a guess. For example, if we assume that this is a trianine, uh, we uh, provide, uh, we decouple at a typical frequency of trianine region, and uh, if, 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 if we hit the, the correct residue type, uh, then we see a uh, signal. Uh, if we uh, decouple at the wrong frequency, we will not see signal. So we see here, in this case, uh, we clearly see that, that uh, we signal, signal for trianine uh, frequency range, but not for serine. And that uh, immediately give us assignment. So now we have a sequence, and overall, this took us only one hour, uh, both for, for experiment and analysis, because analysis, well, we basically do it as fast as we do now. Well, still, we can continue, if you like, to, to be 100% sure that we, we have a correct assignment. We can continue our work. Uh, then we can take this glycine, like this both glycine signals and go further. Well, uh, it's position minus four. Uh, well, if our assignment is correct, then we expect uh, that here we have serine. We can check this with our experiment. And indeed it is serine. So fine. Uh, we can also check what happens for another glycine from here. And we find another residue at minus four position. And uh, it doesn't give signal for serine, uh, but it gives signal for glutamine. Uh, uh, for, for glutamic acid, uh, which is uh, which actually correspond to, to somewhat different uh, uh, peptide sequence uh, in tau, uh, which would and then we know that this is simply because of the overlap and it points to different sequence. So we can discard this this branch.
so we can continue with, with position um, from minus four, we can continue further, we go to minus five and minus six. And at minus six position, you see here we expect, so this value in position minus six should be preceded by proline. And indeed, uh, we find, uh, find this peak in a proline selective experiment. So by doing that, we, uh, we confirm that we are in the right, uh, right branch. And there is other peak here, uh, but we don't even check that because, uh, well, it's not, uh, it's not preceded by proline. So again, it correspond to, to the overlap in the spectrum. Uh, so this check also took maybe another hour. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, there were a couple of more signals uh, affected by phosphorylation. And in particular, there was this peak, uh, which didn't correspond to any proline selective experiment. So we, we checked if we can assign, even if we don't know, uh, is it, uh, well, if you don't have any connection to proline. So we simply start to work uh, until we hit something. So we have position minus one, minus two, minus three. And at position minus three, uh, we find residue which is, uh, 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 which is preceded by proline. Again, we look at the sequence of tau and we find only one signal uh, stretch like that. Uh, and then, well, we can double check if, if it is what we're looking for. And indeed, if you look at the position minus one with this uh, selective experiment, with this uh, C-beta selective experiment, we expect to have uh, uh, leucine. And indeed, if you decouple the leucine frequency, uh, we have this peak. Uh, we may also check uh, next residue, which is, which is supposed to be histidine. And indeed, if we decouple at histidine characteristic frequency, uh, we see signal. Uh, so here, we also 100% sure that it's correct assignment. And by the way, uh, this position, like uh, phosphorylation at, at position uh, CRN 409, uh, was never uh, reported before for this kinase. Uh, I mean, it, it was, uh, it is possible to have it phosphorylated, but uh, nobody ever shown that it can be phosphorylated without priming by other kinases. So that was a little uh, result on the side. Uh, here I'd like to conclude this uh, relatively short presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to suggest some applications for, for this experiment. And uh, these are studies of IDPs uh, and particularly PTMs or maybe other hotspots which you like to assigned maybe at some different conditions or maybe uh, just not don't like to assign everything because you can do it fast. Uh, then uh, you may use it for solving bottlenecks in traditional assignment. Uh, for example, if you manage to assign but some parts are super difficult because of overlap or maybe problem with sensitivity. So then uh, these specific, specific parts can, can be assigned relatively efficiently with this approach. So uh, I like to again emphasize that this is a, uh, these experiments are based not on just selective pulses, but uh, on a selective polarization transfer uh, technique. And we work at one system at a time. Uh, unlike, uh, unlike a common method where we try to, to have all spin systems at once, like in, in 3D experiments or 5Ds, we like to have everything at once. But then we end up in situations like we have uh, one size for all, whereas in our method we can uh, uh, really adjust for specific spin system. Uh, well, again, some highlights. It's fast, uh, sensitive, usually more sensitive with multidimensional experiments, give you super resolution, versatile, easy to analyze. Uh, that's it. And thank you. I'm ready to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Vladislav, uh, for the very nice talk. Uh, While well, the questions are hopefully coming in, um, maybe I can start uh, with, with, with two. Um, and, and the first one is, I mean, the, um, the, the multidimensional experiments that you were, not, not multidimensional, but multi-step transfer experiments that you were um, um, discussing, I, I could imagine they work especially well for IDPs uh, but uh, what about, for example, a membrane protein or something like that, that where you would like to watch uh, the changed assignment uh, due to the uh, translation, um, uh, post-translational modification? Uh, well, yes, I, I agree that, that what we have for the moment, these are experiments which are uh, 
designed on the basis of uh, multi or high dimensional experiments. And this, of course, uh, have a significant toll on sensitivity. So for larger systems, maybe we should uh, end up with uh, lower dimensional experiments. But what's, uh, what's good to say is, is that that's, uh, this polarization transfer it gives you uh, it gives you uh, efficient polarization transfers, and also you can uh, well there are many benefits which I think will be applicable to larger systems as well, uh, because you can target to specific spin system, uh, try different uh, for example if you have a conformational exchange you can maybe design experiment for specific spin system which would suppress that, uh, if you have a large system then you can heavily rely on trossy and particularly polarization inversion. Uh, like uh, well, this technique uh, was shown by uh, Stefan Gleiser at some point that it, it, it gives um, much better efficiency of magnetization transfer than, than any inept or crinap. Uh, so this gives a possibility to, uh, to apply these techniques also, but not exactly these experiments, but here it's more like proof of principle that, that we should work with one system at a time and use selective polarization transfers. Mm. Um. Maybe I can ask a follow-up question. Um, uh, when when you uh, had your introductory slide, uh, you you mentioned um, that uh, you um, that, that is exactly this one. When I mean, you you had also when resonances disappear. So how do you work with disappearing resonances? <laughs> Well, that's <laughs> that's a good question. Of course, <laughs> if you don't see see signals, then then uh, then you cannot work with them. But uh, well, if they disappear, that apparently they were present before, right? So that then you may assign those uh, well in in the uh, in in the system where they were present, and uh, and you see which, which uh, residues disappear. I mean, that, that's maybe kind of a trivial answer to this question. Maybe not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so okay. Part. Okay. Um, how exact? I'll ask a question. How how narrow banded are these? How much would you have to worry? I mean, you set things up on your HNCO, and now you're doing other experiments. Small temperature changes, etc., may shift peaks around. Is it tolerant to those kind of small different small changes? Or um, well. Uh... Uh, the experiments are frequency selective, uh, and, and uh, well, different tr uh, transfer steps they have some with different selectivity. Uh, and of course, if you miss that, uh, then you will not see signal. So in practice, what uh, what you need to do, or uh, you have a you take peak position uh, directly from from your uh, from your sample, for example. You cannot just take uh, assignment from beam or B and, and assume that the peaks will be at exactly the same position for your new sample. Uh, so usually we make this work. So we find the peak, uh, we measure its signal and, and or maybe peak peaking or something and fix exactly these frequencies and go further. Uh, and that, that works nicely because uh, selectivity, uh, well, usually is uh, like few hertz. And of course, you can adjust this somehow, but it's, uh, so, sometimes it, it is also defined somehow with the duration of the polarization transfer, which in turn uh, relates to, to the J couplings, which are used for the transfer. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I understand that the duration requires to be fixed in order to do full transfer between the in-phase and the anti-phase or whatever you do, right? To create pure magnetization, you need a fixed duration with continuous wave or not. Yeah, of course, of course, the CVs, they, they are, they, they need, they are, they are of fixed, fixed duration, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you, if you look at this one, the second, trans, trans, uh, this hartman hahn transfer, of course, we have J couplings here. Mm -hmm. And, and this uh, transfer is, uh, is, well, duration is defined uh, by, by these couplings. And also it, it, it gives you the um, selectivity as well. Of course, you may may increase selectivity, frequency selectivity, if you like, but then it would be like a second maximum. Then you may lose massively on, on, on sensitivity. Okay. Okay. Now some questions are coming in, and um, maybe I go go through, uh, uh, through them. So Walter Chazen was the first. Other than NH, are all experiments detecting heteroatoms? Is it the case that this should allow you to work with deuterated proteins? 
Well, this specific presentation, we used to actually deiterated tau. Uh, but we also have version of experiments for protonated IDPs because most cases IDP are, proton uh, are not deiterated, but uh, the concept applicable there as well. It's simply somewhat different, uh, different pulse sequence, but it works. So I think the question to what is uh, the answer to question uh, to what is uh, question is yes, uh, it's possible to work with deuterated proteins, right? Yeah, it, it, we already work with it. <laughs> exactly. It's really yeah. Deuterated, yeah. Then uh, Jenny Vf uh, Seabrock asks, asks, how do you deal with phosphorylated serine and or treonine in multiple conformations? Uh, well. That, that's the next question, of course, if, if, if we have uh, multiple conformations. Well, if they are distinct, like as distinct frequencies, distinct peaks, we, we can address uh, individual conformations that, uh, that can be done. Uh, if you have a situation of exchange, like line broadening, well, that, uh, that's still open question. But as I said, uh, since we may be, since we can target uh, system with a specific experiment, we maybe can design experiment which will be, which will suppress uh, line broadening for exchange. I mean, one could also translate that in a question of sensitivity that uh, your, your sequences are more sensitive than the uh, broadband sequences. So if you have multiple peaks, I mean, one peak splits up in two or so, it would be even easier than to follow it with a focused spectroscopy than with a broadband spectroscopy, I guess. Exactly. And all, yeah, that, that's one thing that it's more sensitive, but also if, if, if you have a distinct uh, frequencies, then you can maybe separately uh, follow the branches for different conformations. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, Paul Shanda skyrocketed with a question that got uh, supporters. So um, he bypassed all the others. Can you comment on the duration of the selective pulses? Looks like they are very long, hence relaxation losses. And generally, how do these experiments work for larger proteins? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, about selective pulses. We, well, look here. Uh, there is only one selective pulse uh, which is used for the polarization inversion. Uh, and and uh, as, as I already said, this uh, actually may, may be the most uh, optimal polarization transfer uh, because uh, in, in this selective pulse, well, it should be selective uh, enough uh, so not to, to, to invert only uh, only one trossy component and, that, and not touching the anti-trossy. Uh, and then, but uh, still, motivation, uh, we start from Z, so it also spent a lot of time on Z with T1 uh, relaxation. Uh, here, uh, we do not lose anything in comparison to, to, to polarization transfer because these are not selective pulses, these are, these are CVs. Uh, it's simply substitution of broadband like in type transfer with a Hartmann-Hahn transfer. So it takes the same time and, and in terms of sensitivity, it's, it's pretty much the same. And by, by the way, uh, uh, this hartmann Han transfer at, at the low uh, low uh, B1 fields are very tolerant to miscalibrations and B1 and homogeneity, so they're very efficient. Okay, Dorothy Kern, uh, great talk. One of the major bottlenecks for traditional assignments is for exchange broadened peaks. Can you suppress REX in your pulse programs? Uh, well, I didn't show that, but, but uh, there are publications and different approaches where people suppress, well, kind of deal with conformational exchange. So you may check, you may work with multiple quantum coherences, for example. And again, if you can really look, work with, with uh, one, one spin system at a time, then you can adjust uh, specific uh, pulse sequence. Alternatively, well, it's uh, kind of a, uh, well, actually, uh, this. Um, Hartmann Hahn transfer, they, uh, they also to some extent suppress uh, exchange because that, that, that's a, like a spin lock, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. like, uh, can I add a little bit on that? Because I have this. So, in, the, in this polarization transfer, there, all you need to do is fulfill the Hartmann Hahn condition, right? So, there will be a, a ratio of powers. So, the, the absolute power it can be modulated. Is, is that correct? So, so the length. Will will determine the the, the amount of uh, of uh, coherence of this transfer, 
and the, the ratio of the powers uh, has to match in order to proper transfer. Is, is this how it works? Well, yes, since it's, uh, say, heteronuclear Hartmann Hahn, then of course the B1 should be the same for, for both nuclei. Okay. Then in that case, you could go up in powers in order to quench exchange. I guess. No, this is selective. So usually we, we work with uh, B1s like a few hertz, like 10 hertz, like that. So this is very, very small, small powers. But I thought that all you need is to match the ratio of the powers between them. But OK. Yeah, well, in, in words, that's, of course, uh, will be different. So it should be just B1 should be the same. But anyway, in both, it, it, it's a very, very small power. OK. OK, thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have two more questions and maybe then we go to the more informal part of the of the day. So there's a question from Grace Royapa saying, can this be automatically done? Is this pulse program available? So I guess, can the setting of the frequencies of the pulses be done automatically? I'm not exactly sure what this refers to in the question. Uh, well, it's a very good question. Well, first of all, all this, uh, all this, uh, uh, sandwiches of, of pulses, uh, they, are, they are automatically produced in a pulse sequence. We use, we use a wave maker and otherwise these are CV essentially rectangular pulses and powers are calculated. <laughs> so it's actually it's very easy to set up this experiment. So the main parameter which you need to know is the position is the frequency which, which you like to fix. Mm. Uh, and that uh, if you can automate this work, well, in principle, yes, because uh, if, if in, in these experiments, you usually have like one signal and even the very stupid pig picker can find one signal in the spectrum. So then, then it could be automatically propagated and experiment can restart it. We are not quite there yet, uh, but uh, I think we, will, we, we are looking at that. Since it's a collaboration with Wolfgang Bermler, I guess that uh, the past programs are already in the Bruker library or is, is that... Is that coming only, or? Uh, you like Wolfgang to answer? I mean, I, I'm, did I not see Wolfgang Bermel on the, on the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, of course, Bermel, Bermel works with us, and and yeah, he actually Wolfgang already tested these experiments, I think, largely, and also they are at least at the moment, I think they are available for download from from Dmitry's site from from Bitbucket. Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, the, the work is presented at the moment is in in archive as as a preprint. Yeah. And now it is uh, considered for publication somewhere. Yeah. Okay. The last formal question: What concentration of protein one typically needs to do those FOSI experiments? Uh, well, experiments are more sensitive than than other multidimensional experiments, as I said, quite a bit more sensitive. Uh, and in this case, it was tau protein uh, at the concentration of, uh, I don't remember, was it 200 or 250 micromole in three millimeter tube and three millimeter crack probe. Mm -hmm. Okay. 